You're listening to the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, your escape to reality. Hello and welcome to the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. Today is Saturday, September 24th, 2022, and this is your host, Stephen Novella. Joining me this week are Bob Novella. Hey, everybody. Kara Santa Maria. Howdy. Jay Novella. Hey, guys. And Evan Bernstein. Good evening, everyone. So, we are recording this episode live in SGU Studios. Kara is joining us remotely from Florida, away, battening down the hatches while a, a hurricane is bearing down on her. How are you doing down there, Kara? Well, it's not here yet, but I'm. I... I'm supposed to go home to L.A. next Thursday, and then I just found out right after I booked the tickets that we're quite probably going to be hit with a Category 3 hurricane on Wednesday. It'll be my first ever. So I did tornadoes in Texas, (laughs) uh, earthquakes in California, hurricanes now in Florida. Just need to move on to an active volcano. Yeah, there you go. Now, Kara, you know, according to Florida rules, you need to be mowing your lawn when that hurricane hits, right? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you need to be outside doing something as if there's no danger. Right, and, and my cow needs to be untethered. Right. Yeah. Because the low pressure of the system raises the grass a little straighter, makes it easier to cut. So, I mean, it's kind of an obvious move. <laughs> now, NASA is still planning on launching Artemis on Tuesday. Did they finally yeah. scrub That's it? That's so not oh, going to happen. Scrub yeah. <laughs> well, they, they like to wait till the last minute because sometimes these things zig instead of zag and they don't want to miss their window. But I guess but yeah, the, the latest update is they just scrubbed it. Not surprising. I thought yeah. there was a little bit of wishful thinking. So part of the reason why we are recording this episode, and there'll be another episode that we're recording as part of a live stream, is because our second book, The Skeptic's Guide to the Future, is coming out in just three days on September 27th. So this is this book is The Skeptic's Guide to the Future. But, uh, Bob Jay and I wrote this one. This was a ton of fun to research, to talk about, to, you know, to design, figure out what goes into it, to write. You know, we've already had a few interviews about it. It's super fun to talk about. You know, essentially what we do in this book is we go through first the history of futurism, right? Mm-hmm. So previous attempts at predicting the future and how did they do? What did they get wrong? What what patterns of wrongness are there? Like the, we talk about uh, futurism fallacies, the common mistakes that futurists make over and over again. We looked a little bit into futurism as an academic discipline to see what they're saying there, et cetera. And then, the, you know, the, the meat of the book is we talk about the cutting edge technologies, where they're coming from where they are now, and then we try to extrapolate them into the future, the near future, the medium future, and then the distant future when those technologies are fully mature. What is like the mm. ultimate potential of these technologies? And we had fun. Th- that was the fun part because then, you know, when we discussed, you know, what is this technology going to look like 50, 100, 1,000 years from now, then we we took the opportunity to write some science fiction mm-hmm. to illustrate that technology in use, which I thought came out really well. Like that was a ton of fun, like discussing what those, you know, what that could look like in use. Yeah, they're like, they're, we call them vignettes. They're like not even really a full short story. It's just a glimpse of the future. Right. And they bring in, and they bring into lots of different technologies yeah. that we had just discussed, you know. Or that we're about to discuss. We're about to discuss yeah. in, in the book. So it's not just one tech, but a bunch of them all in one story. Yeah, yeah. And that, of course, is one of the main themes of the book. Like one of the futurism fallacies is to think that, what, how will this one technology look in the future? But you can't think about it that way because by the time you get to that point that you're talking about, all other technologies will have been advancing in the background, right? So like, hopefully, yeah. So I say, well, what what will you know fusion power look like in 50 years? It's like you you can't talk about that without also talking about what solar power is going to look like in 50 years, and uh, you know all other sources of energy because it's always going to be compared to all of the other options. Or if we, we talk a lot about space travel and we think, oh, by the time we get, you know, intertel- you know, here are the problems that we'll be facing with, with spending a lot of time in space or interstellar travel. It's like, yeah, but by the time we get that, we might be cyborgs. Mm-hmm. We probably <laughs> will be. We'll be genetically engineered. We may just, you know, transfer into a robot for the trip, you know, or whatever. Like, wow. you have to think about all the other things that are happening. It's not going to be us. Right, right. It's, it's not going to be us in the future. That's what we want. Mm-hmm. We want to imagine us right. in the future, but that's not what's going to be happening. And if you look at previous predictions of the future and, and futurists, that's what, that's a classic mistake. They take themselves, their culture, yeah. and they just put it 
and plop it into place with with this new fancy technology. Right. And that's a, a, a classic mistake that you see over and over and over. Right. And it's important because part of pre, quote unquote predicting the future is thinking about how people are going to interact with that technology. And again, we imagine how we're going to interact with that technology. But I think we're living at a very interesting time. Probably our generation, or maybe more than any other generation, has a firsthand example of like for those of us who have kids, like the, our kids have a different relationship with technology than we do, oh, you know, gosh, yes. mm-hmm. right? They use social media. They use their smartphone. They use all these things differently than we do. They think about it differently. You know, they, um, they prioritize different things. Like my, my daughters rarely, if ever, use their phone as a phone. You know, it's <laughs> not really a phone for them. They use it way more to text or to communicate on certain social media apps. Or whatever. Wait, Steve, do you use your phone as a, you like make phone calls? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what? Just <laughs> just yesterday, I was telling Rachel, and when yeah. I was her age, I had two means of communicating with people. I wrote them a letter, or I picked up a phone yep. and called them, and that was it. Or you met it? them in yeah, person. Yeah, or you met them in person. But short, but short of that, because well, I moved around the country a lot, I had to, when I could communicate with my friends. So we talked about how that happened. I mm-hmm. said I wrote letters and made phone calls that cost $15 for 30 minutes. That's right. how you communicated with people across the... I was it. And like, I remember worrying about the cost of making a phone call. Absolutely. You had to, oh you had to call it off peak hours so that you wouldn't get charged the prime rate because yep. my parents would kill me if they found if I ran up a $50 phone a bill. Long distance phone for call. A, yeah. for, a, for a call to my friend back at the other side of the country. I think Steve's a little bit anomalous though because I mean, I definitely use my phone a lot and I definitely don't use it mostly for making phone calls. There's just so much other stuff that I, that, the obvious stuff. Oh that yeah. I, that I, I mean, do. A, a smartphone but, is probably the phone app is one of the least used aspects yeah. of it. Absolutely. My, my smartphone is my, my handheld computer. That's not my point. If it disappeared, I do, could we get I, by without it? I do call and accept phone calls. Like it is right. still my phone. Yeah. My daughters, they turned off their ringer. Like they don't use it <laughs> yeah, at I don't all have a ringer. as a my, phone. My phone is on silent with no oh. notifications ever for my mental health. But I'm curious. So the only time I ever talk on the phone, and I guess that's changed a little since I've been in Florida without a car, but in California, the only time I would have conversations was when I was driving long distances. Mm-hmm. Does mm-hmm. anybody else have that same vibe? Like the only time I talk to people is in the car. That's not the only time, but that's definitely a huge opportunity because you're just right, sitting right. there doing nothing, and it's a good you know you could talk to people. And now that you know it's easy if, it's when you yeah. put, route the phone through your car, so you're not holding it. So you're not. Well, where are off. you talking to people then? If you're not if you're not on the phone, are you not having phone conver- Are you not having you know? Yeah. Conversation. Just communicate just in virtual time, yeah, with texts and emails and whatever. Uh, no, I'm definitely I'm definitely more of a phone talker than a texter. Oh, and then if I like, if I'm missing somebody and we want to have like time together, like quality time together, then we FaceTime. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I primarily use my phone to get angry at the internet. I think if I summarize my interaction. (laughs) Jay's an angry old Facebook man. I am pissed (laughs) off at basically everybody that uses social media. I I log in and I'm instantly furious with what I see. Mm -hmm. But this is a classic sort of futurism fallacy again, in that. You know, past futurists pretty much unanimously imagined that in the future, you know, the amorphous future, when the technology existed, people will will video call, right? And now we have we assumed it. Even we did. Yeah. Oh, that was, years, that was twenty many, years ago, thirty years ago. That was time. the obvious next step for phones. So we have now we have you could video call, audio call, or text, and people prefer texting. Yeah to audio and mm-hmm. audio to video. Like it's the exact opposite of what everyone predicted and prior more, to... I mean, I think they all have different though, uses. But that's the thing. We, you know, until right. you put a technology in the hands of billions of people and see how they use it, it's hard to predict. Most, most futurists right. think we're going to use future technology like we use current technology. So here's another fun example. Yep. Yep. When commercial airplane travel was be first, first becoming a thing, Futurist imagined that it would evolve into these gigantic luxury airplanes. Flying hotels, almost. They were flying like, cruise ships, right? Mm-hmm. Right, like so they, luxury liners. They were right. like luxury liners in the air. That is how they were imagined because they assumed that the use and priorities, it's all about luxury, right, would hold true even to – would translate to this new technology. And they didn't anticipate – like, no, people are going to want to get there fast and cheap. Right. And – 
I mean, they, you know, who, now we've gone all the, like, so far the other direction where, we're, like, we're crammed into these tiny seats, you know, and you could pay through the nose for a first class seat where you get a slightly bigger seat, you know, or, right? or no, lots Makes of other airlines, lots of other airlines I've seen where you can go super ultra mega first class. Oh, where you, that. I mean, you yeah. literally get a, a TV this big, a little room, and a foot rub. Yeah. Somebody comes in and gives you a foot rub, but you're spending forty thousand dollars. I mean, how many people yeah. are going to really but, do and, that? And, and Bob, break? even that's nothing compared to the luxury liners that they imagined, where like right. you, it was like you're right. living in a hotel tell while you're on the plane yeah, yeah. Titanic you know, in, in completely the different yeah Kara have you ever called the remote control the clicker uh, I have <laughs> okay but that that takes to yeah. the original remote device You're, which made a click tethered. noise no no no, no. Yeah. It would you would make a literal clicking sound the frequency, when you right. hit the button. It would hit a like tuning fork rod, mm-hmm. which would vibrate at a specific frequency, and the TV would respond to that frequency. So you had like three or four three controls. Buttons, that's it. Yeah, like three or four buttons, like volume, uh, you know, channel up down, and channel off. up down, on off. That's that was it. it. Oh yeah. That's and it literally so clicked. Weird. Yeah, so, so you retro. people, yeah, so people still call it the clicker. clicker. We also still say tape, like we're going to tape something, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's the, when tape sort of, yeah. is nowhere in the loop. But they make anymore. it; they, they, those things, people understand what they, yeah, what they mean. Yeah, yeah. And and you know, I promise all of you that that are young, you'll feel old one day too. Mm-hmm. Whatever whatever you think is normal now, it mm-hmm. won't be in thirty years, and, you, and you'll be doing the same thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> God and, damn it! And, and it will probably just speed up. Yeah, and like oh, gosh, you know, yes. like a twenty-five-year-old and a twenty-year and a twenty-year-old might find see dramatic differences uh, as the pace of increase, uh, you know, accelerates mm-hmm. as I, it probably will. And we're just skimming the surface, oh, man. <laughs> of this book. The third section of the book goes into um, science fiction technology. So we go beyond actual technology, where like the roots of it, even if like the beginnings of it already exist, even if it's just a a proof of concept or a theory at this point. And then we just talk about crazy sci-fi tech and discuss like, is this even possible? Like lightsabers, you know, things like that. Like Anti-gravity. Is, is it even possible no. that we could possibly make a lightsaber? Transporters. Um, and what would that be like? And again, you think about it, like by the time, if you could make a lightsaber, that technology would be useful for so many other right. things. Yeah, it would be, it would be so <laughs> that power source. That power source. It'd yeah, be I'm a game changer. Into my building and run my building off of that. Yeah, right. Exactly. That's, That's like a, the transporter, you know, like when you, in yeah. Star Trek, you know, like it, it would, it, that one invention would change reality. It would mm-hmm. change everybody's life. In, in ways that, you know, would be impossible to predict. Yeah, or, or I got, my my favorite, and we go into this in the book, the holodeck. God. If you could do that, oh my gosh. why would you confine that to one little room, right? Why wouldn't the whole ship be a holodeck, right? You just, right. The, so it, it would configure itself as needed to whatever functionality you needed anywhere yeah. on the ship, yeah. except, you know, with the only exception of... <laughs> Assuming you had intricate limitless power. machines that it couldn't make. Assuming you had limitless power. Every right. every disposal. room would become a room of requirement. Yeah, yeah basically. Yeah, basically. Uh, yeah pretty much. But and, it wouldn't. And all you would need is uh, give me a holodeck and a replicator, and I'm good. I'm done. Yeah. Goodbye, see, everybody. Have a nice life. <laughs> I would check out at that point. You 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 go into Bob's holodeck like 50 years later, and it would be like a Halloween planet. Yeah. He would have constructed right. Also, don't go in there with a black light. <laughs> oh my God. I saw the wow. joke and I took it. Yeah. <laughs> Holy shit. We encourage anyone who's interested in any of the things we're talking about, anything about futurism and future technology and existing technology and the history of technology, all of that and sci fi stuff, to pre order the book, The Skeptic's Guide to the Future. Uh, if you're listening to this after September 27th, you can order the book just directly and they'll send it to you. Um, the links are on, you can get to the links on our home pa- on our the SGU page you go to the you know slash books and then that takes you to the publisher who has all the actual links to specific sellers uh, I also will remind you that we this is our second book don't forget about the skeptics guide to the universe that's our first book it's still selling quite well actually yeah let's get to yeah, some actual content Bob Oh, boy. You're going to do a Forgotten Superhero of Science. Yeah, I haven't done this in a while. So, yes, Forgotten Superheroes of Science. This is uh, Ray Jean Montague, 1935 to 2018, naval engineer and the first female program manager of ships in the United States Navy. 
Uh, in her own words, she said, I'm known as the first person to design a ship using the computer. Cool. Motsky was inspired early in life when, uh, for, her, for her, you know, her scientific career. When she was seven, I believe in 1940, her grandfather took her on a tour of a captured German sub. Wow. And she said, uh, she's quoted as saying about that experience, I looked through the periscope and saw all these dials and mechanisms. And I said to the guy who was giving the tour, uh, what do you have to know to do this? And he replied, oh, you'd have to be an engineer. You don't have to worry about that. And the implication, <laughs> of course, mm -hmm. a, young, a young black girl, you know, is never going to become an engineer. And don't forget, and also this was like in the 1940s. So imagine, you know, the attitudes then for somebody mm -hmm. like that becoming an engineer. I mean, it's almost unimaginable how bad it was. You know, today, it's not great. Back then, oof. But uh, Montague joined the United States Navy in 1955 in, uh, in Washington, D.C., and she was a clerk typist, and she was sitting right next to the UNIVAC-1. UNIVAC-1. UNIVAC. Um, yeah. So if you remember, the ENIAC was the first programmable electronic general purpose digital computer. Uh, there were other computers at that time that had some of those capabilities, but th that was the first one to have pretty much all of that um, at the same time. And it was completed in 1945, and uh, it was used for the United States Army's Ballistic Research Lab. Of course, uh, it, was a, it was an amazing tool. Um, of course, it was, you know, it was a computer. UNIVAC-1 was essentially the business version of the ENIAC. That's, that's basically what that was. It was the very first successful civilian computer, and it was obviously, th that was a critical piece of the dawn of the computer age. I mean, it's, it's a milestone of milestones right there. And she was sitting right next to it. She was working next to it. And the story goes that one day, a lot, all of the engineers called in sick for whatever reason. I don't know if they were really partying the night before, but none of them came in. And she was able uh, to dive right in and accomplish some work on the, uh, on the Univac 1 because she had seen and she had observed the engineers using it for, for quite a while. Soon after that, she was studying computer programming at night school, and then uh, then the promotions seemed to come very, very quickly for her. She was appointed uh, as a computer systems analyst at the Navy Ship Engineering Center, and then program director for the Naval Sea Systems Command Integrated Design, Manufacturing, and Maintenance Program, and uh, then division head for the Computer Aided Design and Computer Aided Manufacturing, CAD, CAD CAM program. And deputy program manager of the Navy's Information Systems Improvement Program. So lots of titles, lots of responsibilities. And then back in 1971, her department was challenged with, with a task to create a computer-generated ship design. Never, had never really been done before. She pulled together a lot of uh, systems, some automated systems that had been created, pulled them together. And within 19 hours, she had a, a, an initial draft. Uh, for an Oliver Hazard Perry class frigate, Perry class frigate. I, I like the sound of that. Mm -hmm. um, in 19 hours, uh, that made her the first person to design a ship using a computer system. And then after that, uh, she worked on a Seawolf class submarines, Nimitz class aircraft carriers, and Dwight D. Eisenhower. And uh, and I'm uh, just amazing to think she started as a clerk typist, and and uh, she ultimately was doing amazing things and and breaking ground. And what a the, life! Being the first, incredible. Yeah, being involved in all those different things that is fantastic, yeah, amazing. And uh, and also, you know, you can imagine, you know, the pushback she got being, you know, being a black woman, and uh, at at that time. So I'm sure that, that wasn't easy as well. Well, so, it's a it, testament to just how unbelievably talented and, and intelligent she was. Like she had to oh, yeah. blow people's minds in order Ab to get absolutely. There. And that's that's a common thread in a lot of these superhero uh, segments that I've done where they were just so – they were so superior that uh, the, it couldn't be denied you know, in a lot of cases. She, that, and that's unfortunate that you have to be so amazing just, just, to, just to get the same opportunities that people who are average amazing yeah. uh, have. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So remember the United States Navy's hidden figure, Ray Jean Montague. Mention her to your friends. Or Jay, mention her to your friend, especially when <laughs> discussing. It's, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> it's just Bob. <laughs> especially when discussing drawing interchange formats, cattle bar arrangements, or especially geometric modeling kernels. Ooh, I like those. Yes, thank you. All right, Sorry. Jay, tell us about the future of vat grown meat. This isn't the future of uh, of vat grown meat. It's more about the the difference between plant based meats and 
traditional and like, meat-based meats and meat-based meats that are happening today. <laughs> and, and, and the you know the real question here when we compare the two is you know how sustainable are are you know these plant-based meats? You know what what is their what is the profile? And I you know after doing some research and reading about it, it's pretty interesting. Like you know how we got to plant-based meats. And then we're comparing like the energy and resources that it takes to create them versus traditional meats, okay? Mm -hmm. So as everybody knows, a lot of people eat meat and unfortunately meat demand, if anything, it's just going up. I have to admit the older I get, I am way more conscious now about my meat eating usage. You know, I just don't, I just don't, I try to lower it as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And as much as I do love meatballs and everything, like, you know, I've def, I, I don't let myself go there it's like maybe once every couple of months at this point, where it was more like every two weeks, which is a big difference for me. Every two weeks is fine. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing about just eating, you know, traditional meat is that it once is once a week is fine. <laughs> it, it takes a, a significant toll on the environment. You know, animal agriculture promotes deforestation, greenhouse gas emissions, air and water pollution. So eating meat is just not helping global warming, which, which, you know, is getting worse and everything seems to be getting worse. So, but just as I have to say, because we've covered this topic before, you know, just to, to give it more nuance to that, that doesn't mean like zero meat consumption is what's optimal. Yeah. Right. And I know this is controversial because there are some people who think that that is the case, mm. but you know, when, when we've done a deep dive on this topic, I think it's a fairer summer summary is that we should really have a lot less meat consumption, mm -hmm. but not zero because there's an integrated agricultural system, you know, where there's, you know, animals are good at converting non-human calories into human calories. Mm -hmm. So there, there, there can be an efficiency there and they can use land, which is not usable, you know, for, for growing food for people. And, you know, they can eat food that people can eat and then convert that into food and they produce a lot of fertilizer half of our yeah. food we grow oh with gosh, we with cattle that. cattle manure so if we they all went away that would be a huge problem for yeah. the agricultural system so there's you're and, saying there's a healthy balance in there yeah somewhere. so there's yeah there's a, there's probably a sweet spot in there somewhere we're not at it right now where i think we were just demand is requiring that we produce more meat than is optimal for the system but but not to imply that that there's a consensus that we need to go to zero meat consumption and right there's now. studies that show that it, that a you know that a meat consumption at decent at, at certain levels is perfectly healthy yeah. and is not and is not going to give you a heart attack. Right. So approximately fifteen percent of global greenhouse gas emissions come from livestock, and it, and mm -hmm. like I said, it's only going to go up in, as demand for meat goes up. They're saying that there will be a fifteen percent increase in meat demand in the next decade. That is significant. That is way more than I would have guessed. Mm. Greenhouse gases come from where? When you're talking about grazing animals like sheep goats and cows, right? They, these animals burp methane that comes from them dige digesting grasses and the like. So greenhouse gases also happen to come from chemicals that are used to grow feed. So there's lots of things in the industry that are the result of these greenhouse gases. So interestingly, chickens and pigs have much lower gas emissions than cows, which I did not know. They're also better at converting the calories they eat into muscle. So for example, when we compare chickens, pigs, and cows, chickens need to eat about two pounds of feed for each pound of edible tissue gained. Pigs yeah. need three to five pounds of feed, and cows per need... Pound. What? Per pound. Yeah, everything is per pound. So a pig needs to eat three to five pounds of feed to, to make an edible pound. And then cows need six to ten pounds of feed. Whoa. Yeah, so it's a, it's a really big difference here. And goats for, are even worse. They're like, they're like 15, 16. And fish are close to one to one. Wow. Yeah, fish oh, yeah. are the fish best. Are, Goats yeah. and sheep are pretty bad, but they're not consumed as bad. in as large quantities yeah. across the globe yeah, as I mean, cows. Just he reading these stats, like eat chicken and fish. I mean, that, that's a good yeah. shift mm -hmm. in your meat right there. Just just focus on them. Cows produce six, t six times more gas than pigs and approximately nine times more than chickens. Mm. So they are clearly um, – you know, the biggest problem when it comes to grazing animals. Yes. So today we have products that simulate the taste of meat, but and they're completely plant-based. And I don't know if you guys have ever tried them, but mm -hmm. I have. I have. I've tried them all. I'll tell you I've about tried. it. They taste nothing like meat. So plant <laughs> I love Impossible Burgers. Taste or texture? Impossible Burgers, Steve, you would not know the difference. Oh, absolutely I know the difference. You've no, had you know them. the difference, but they're the closest, I think. If somebody gave it to I've had them. We somebody gave it to me and didn't tell me, point. I wouldn't even... Yeah, for hamburger, it. it's fine. I mean, I, uh, so it's just a little. That's bit a separate weedier. question. If you, I, I mean, they taste fine. I would never confuse it for beef. 
right. that they taste. I think fine. it tastes better than beef. That's but that's okay. different. Do you how just good have a plain, it is, a plain, is a different question. What, than what do you have on your hamburger? You know, yeah, the whole shebang. Ketchup, yeah. Pickles. By the time you put all I your condiments, flavor. you know, like how much, are you, you know. So plant-based foods create significantly lower levels of greenhouse gases than meat-based foods. Mm-hmm. During the 12-hour show, and this is my anecdote, last year, right? When we do that? Last, a year ago, last spring? I cooked meatballs for everybody in real time. And I also made Ian, because Ian is a vegetarian, I made him plant-based meatballs. And I got to tell you, legit, they tasted good. They were good. They weren't, you know, they use? weren't beef, but they were a very good flavor and the texture was fantastic. So I wasn't really that disappointed in them. Jay, what did you use? I used Impossible Burger meat. Impossible. Okay. Yep. Yeah. I've also had Shepherd's Pie made completely out of Impossible Burger and that was fantastic because it's, it's heavy with, you know, spices. So it, yeah. it obfuscates the flavor. And, you know, so the, so the point of me saying this is you could use plant-based meats in dishes where... You know, there's a lot of spices and everything, like for tacos and mm-hmm. things like that. Like, you could just think about swapping that in right away because it tastes fantastic. So researchers were able, were able to make a plant-based product that has similar traits as real meat by figuring out exactly what makes meat meat. You know, why, is, why, why does meat taste like meat? Why does it have the texture that it has? Why does it have the flavors that it has? So as an example, many of the products that they use, like, like coconut oil is a great example. They use coconut oil, I believe, in Impossible Burger because it has a similar animal fats feel in your mouth. Kara, it seems to me like you and I talk about heme quite a bit. For some reason, you and I are always chit-chatting about heme. Leg hemoglobin. Heme. Yeah. Hemoglobin. <laughs> so this heme is the red liquid. The now, this isn't blood. It's the red liquid protein that comes out of meats. When you, If you have you know, a steak or, or even, even uh, ground beef, if you squeeze it, you see this Red liquid come out. It's you, blood. But by the way, it's not leg red hemoglobin. Liquid. It's blood. It's it, not. It's not exactly blood, Steve. It's a part of blood. It yeah, it's a part of blood. Like Watery blood. blood. It's, it's a part of blood, and it's pretty amazing. When I visited the Impossible headquarters for a TV show, I had to like taste leg hemoglobin, which is the version that they use, the animal based version, or sorry, the plant based version they use in Impossible Meat, and it tastes like your mouth, like your mouth is full of blood. Yeah, like mm-hmm. it's gross. To just eat on its own. It makes but, you feel weird. But that's right. And you're not supposed to. But Kara, the point is, <laughs> and I want to make this perfectly yeah, clear, that. they made a plant-based version of heme. Well, all plants have it. They just were able to – first they isolated it from soy. Yeah. And then when they realized that the quantity that they could get was so tiny, they started genetically engineering yeast to produce it yep. because it's just so much more efficient to do it that way. Yeah, and they, they, you know, so they cultivate these yeasts, and then they create reactors that the yeast can, you know, multiply in, and then it cranks. This is like insulin, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. This is this is by the way is how we, you know, insulin is made. So taking a close look at how much energy is needed to produce these products will answer the overall question that I'm putting to everybody here: is you know how much better is plant based meats for the environment than regular meat? So let me give you guys a little bit of a, a background here. So each ingredient needs to be traced back to where it comes from from all the processes. Right? There's a ton of processes that they need to get through in order for it to be the final version that's found in a plant-based meat. And this is called life cycle analysis. Mm-hmm. So, for example, each ingredient is what? They're farmed because they're plants. They're transported, and then they're processed. And each of, in each of those three stages, there's a lot of things happening and that they had to track all of those different steps and every single thing that happens. So each step along the way uses fuel, uses water, uses land, uses chemicals, and and they have to total up all this information for each ingredient, and that gives us the final answer. But the snag is, because there's always a freaking snag, is that the information wasn't readily available to these researchers. The companies that make plant-based meats, you know, they're keeping their products and ingredients and all of that information to themselves because it's proprietary. You know, they don't want to like say, here's everything that we do and every single w- process that we use because that is part of their, their company's business, right? And it, it does make sense. I don't think they're doing it to, to, to you know, for uh, malfeasance. They're doing it because they don't want other companies to copy what they're doing. Yep. It is their intellectual property. So scientists had to rely on information that these companies shared <laughs> about their products. That is the one disclosure that I have here. I'm just assuming that they gave a relatively accurate uh, rendition of what's actually taking place. So to get to some numbers, Impossible Burger production only creates 11% of the greenhouse gases produced by the same amount of beef. That is significantly less. Yeah, that's significant. Other plant-based meat producers were showing similar numbers as well. So compared to pork and chicken, uh, pork was 37% of, of beef 
and chicken was 57%, which is even better. You know, these, no, these numbers are, are, are pretty significant when you think about the, the impact on the environment. Researchers also found that the amount of water use was only 23% of that in beef, 11% used by pork, and 24% in chicken for equal amounts of protein. So the, they're, they're dramatically less. Land use has huge differences as well. Plant-based use was 2% of what beef uses for the same amount of protein, 2%. Wow. 18% for pork and 23% for chicken. Land use is important because, you know what, land, land is very important here because it has, there is a potential huge amount of carbon storage that a, an acre of land can have. And when you're, when you're deforesting tens of thousands of acres, unfortunately, of the Amazon, you're getting rid of an incredible amount of vegetation that's holding a lot of carbon. So it, it all but adds again, up. But again, you know, there's, cause there's always multiple angles here. Land that like cattle are grazing on is not rainforest, right? right? And so there, a lot of that land use is not arable land or land that we could be using for agriculture. And there is a, there's a separate movement, like another way to mitigate the resource util- use of, of cows and meat, you know, um, meat-based animals mm-hmm. is to feed them more. <laughs> meat-based animals. Yeah, <laughs> more, uh, t- to feed them more of the uh the refuse you know mm-hmm. like like you so you don't grow grains to feed them you feed them the leftover stuff from other from, processes from human agriculture yeah. so that is more of like a circular system uh so so it, you know it remains to be seen how far that can go but there is a huge movement in agriculture to do that i just read a recent you know news item about that Steve, fact, they they are clearing amazon forest for grazing purposes and soybeans are also huge very high on the list of what's being grown in in former Amazon forest right now. Yeah. So it is it is a problem, and you know that they're whacking back those. That's a, a separate problem, yeah. even without animals yeah. for any reason. That's a problem, it, and right. you know even if they're just growing crops, even if whether animals are in the mix or not or not, that's the worst thing they could be doing. Is you know what they're essentially doing is burning down the forest and then planting crops to get all the nutrients out of that, and then they move on once yeah. they. It's not even burning down a forest. They're they're like burning down libraries, essentially. I mean, because you've got genetic diversity in those rainforests that, and they're and they're isolated. You can have a genetic diversified area that is that is unique, and no other area. Once that's gone, that is gone. There's millions of years of evolution now gone that we will never retrieve. There could be amazing drugs in there. Uh, amazing genetic information that is gone. So it's it's so far worse than just burning down trees and stuff. There are alternatives. Uh, Like you can farm the forest right you can you know right. pl- plant and cultivate and whatever things that will grow within the forest without having right. to destroy yeah, the like forest castanias itself. yeah like brazil nut trees they're really sustainable it's a great way to harvest things that are already growing there and not disrupt the ecosystem and, and they could also use the land they're already using for farming better by planting things which regenerate the soil that are also cash crops you know but so they're just not doing it smartly. They're not doing it well. Well, in some areas, people really are doing it smartly, oh, yeah. and in other areas, there's too much demand, and the the cost is too high, and individuals are going to do what they need to do to maintain their livelihood. Absolutely. So this is way bigger than the boots on the ground in the Amazon. It's oh, the yeah. pressure from countries like ours asking for tropical hardwoods and asking for more crops to be grown and more animals to be um, produced in those areas. Jay, I think it's important to note because I've been looking at the um, at the comments. Mm-hmm that a lot of these lab-grown or synthetic meats that try to emulate real meat, the target audience is not people who are already not eating meat. Because you hear a lot of times people going, it grosses me out. It tastes too much like real meat. I don't want to eat fake meat. It's not for you. The idea that like the CEO of Impossible, when I interviewed him, I think Pat Brown is his name. He was very clear I wanted to develop this so that I could give an altern- alternative to people who are doing the environmental harm, people, people who, like who are meat. eating large quantities yeah, of yeah. meat, exactly, yeah. so that they have an option to do better without giving up what they love. So the, I think the, the meta problem here is that, um, yeah, there are smart agricultural practices. There are optimal you know, agricultural practices. We can get the system to be more circular and work together better. 
but it's not like there is a world agricultural organization that actually controls what every farmer does, mm -hmm. right? And so what you have is individual farmers making individual decisions that are in their best interest. And, and a, a lot of the times it's like, well, they're making decisions so they don't starve. They're making decisions so that they don't lose money doing mm -hmm. what they're doing. The margins are so razor thin with agriculture. And so um, they're, they're not necessarily doing what's optimal for the whole system. But we're at a point with, you know, 8 billion people on the planet where we've already basically using up all the arable land and because of global warming, where we need the whole system to be efficient together. Yeah. And that's really what we're talking about is moving towards an integrated system coordinated. That's, that's coordinated and that's optimal. And that may mean having to pay poor people to not do stuff or right. giving them better paying to give them better ways to do things or integrating it better. Uh, but but again, if individuals will make smart decisions for themselves that are not good for the whole system. Yeah, that's really sure. the problem. Right. That's, that's why we have poaching. That's why we yeah. have gold mining in the Amazon, because it's the only option these people have. You know, I think it's fair to note here, there are some drawbacks to plant-based meats. Like right now, they cost 40, 43% more than products that they're trying to replace, which is mm -hmm. a lot. And I did go on, I did some online searching and verified that that's true. Which so, is another point. Like if you're, if you're like a poor farmer in Africa, sometimes animal protein is the cheapest, best protein you can get access yeah. to. And that's very important for certain people. Again, yeah. we can't just look at this from our perspective where like we have no issues with getting enough food or calories or high yeah. quality proteins or stuff. When most of the world is living on the edge, we have to be very careful about any changes that we make. And right now, uh, plant-based meats are only 1% of the market, yeah. which is basically, yeah. you know, almost, not, it's nothing. I would just like to say at this point, eat green leafy vegetables, eat beans, eat grains. Lentils. Be, this is, this is much healthier than, you know, predominantly eating meats. Well, again, it's all about balance, but we definitely should eat more of that. Right. Yeah, we more, are generally right. in the West. You yeah. know. Well, everyone, we're going to take a quick break from our show to talk about our sponsor this week, BetterHelp. And let's not sugarcoat it, everyone. It's a, it's a tough time out there and a lot of people are struggling. And if you are struggling and you have never decided to take the plunge and talk to somebody, uh, maybe now is the time. It's so important to prioritize our mental health. If we put that first, everything else really can follow and, and, BetterHelp can help you with that. You know, I myself work as a therapist and I also go to therapy. And I can tell you that online therapy has been really, really beneficial for a lot of folks where it's, you know, it fits better within your day. You have limitations to be able to get in the car and drive somewhere. Being able to talk to somebody online can be really a lifesaver. And it's the model that I'm now using all the time. Yeah, Kara, you could do it on your phone or, you know, your iPad if you want to. And any, any way that you connect with the video, you could even live chat with therapy sessions so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. And the other great thing is you could be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Our listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash SGU. That's BetterHelp.com slash SGU. All right, guys, let's get back to the show. Bob, you're going to talk to us about whether or not we should go back to the moon or why should we go back to the moon? Okay. In a half hour, so, good luck. Yeah. So <laughs> 1962, September 12th, what happened? JFK did his, his, his uh, he announced his public plan. The moonshot to, speech. To put man on the moon at the end of the decade, right? Big, big, huge milestone. And now it's 60 years later, 60 years later, and the United States is about to launch the first mission of the Artemis program to go back to the moon. Th there's a lot of people that are saying that, ah, let's go to Mars. For example, Apollo 11 astronaut, Jay, yeah. Michael Collins. Yes. He and Mars Society founder, Robert Zubrin, both of them have long been advocates of, of America going directly to Mars and not the moon. So He's biased. When so, you've been to the moon, yeah, go to Mars. Right? So, <laughs> you, you know, it's not unreasonable to say, all right, why are we going back? Why repeat what's already been done, been there, done that? Why do we need to go that, to go back there? And I mean, one good reason, one, the big overarching reason is Mars practice. Sure. We need to practice going to Mars and it's a test bed in a lot of ways. So there's lots of examples. Uh, that's part of that. One is radiation. We've talked about radiation uh, many times on the show, the radiation, the cosmic rays, solar particles that are in space for long distance travel are horrific. 
you could go there and be like, well, I got my dose of, uh, of radiation for my entire life now. And uh, cancer, all this stuff, it's, it's horrible. And we've talked to NASA people, and their attitude is, yeah, we don't have any good solutions right now. The big plan now is to get there fast and then treat, it medic- and treat the problems as they arise medically. And like, that yeah. was it. That was it. So th- this is a hard nut to crack, mm. dealing, with, dealing with the radiation. It's a, it's a huge problem, and there's no way we can go to Mars right now. It's really no way for lots of reasons, but radiation is, is a huge one. So now Artemis is planning from its very first mission, they're going to do experiments and studies on what radiation does to living organisms, and they're going to be testing various things. Like, how about this one? At first, I'd never heard about this. An anti-radiation vest. They're looking at an anti-radiation vest. Wow, I want to learn a little bit more about that because that sounds... Just a vest? Yeah, that's... Uh, well, I mean, you know, whatever. I don't know anything it's starting. Much right. Make a whole suit it. out of it, I suppose, at some point. You start with a vest? Is that the point? I don't... I don't know. I mean, I, I guess that's... Hey. Well, the thing is, there's different tolerances for your limbs and your organs and your thyroid, which is the most yeah. most yeah. vulnerable. So, like, when x-ray techs don't wear a, a suit, they just wear a vest. And they wear a, 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 a goi- you know, a okay. collar. What do you call that? The thing that goes around your neck. <laughs> a goiter collar. Not a goiter. <laughs> it's go- not a... <laughs> a, a, a ascot. There's, there's a name for that. I think the things that go around <laughs> to protect your neck. So it makes sense. Right, your arms yeah, and legs sure. just don't they're not I don't have the vulnerable stuff that your internal organs has. My friend is an IR physician and she wears these like she wears like the vest thing and then she wears these like bananas glasses, like these really intense goggles mm-hmm. when she's doing her yeah. work so that she doesn't get radiation in her eyeballs. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. And also whenever we talk about radiation in space, Bob, I know you know this, but we have to d- se- separate out well just to, even just like solar radiation from galactic intergalactic cosmic, cosmic rays, rays yeah. like everything we're talking about like a vest or shielding or whatever is only about solar radi- radiation right. there is no shielding for cosmic rays i'm bombarded and, by cosmic rays right now co- well the atmosphere protects us oh yes that's what course, protects right. us and really really well but without an ocean of atmosphere above you or feet of rock or something like that any shielding that we can devise would actually make the problem worse it just traps it inside oh, so it bounces, bounces around. around. Yeah, it does even more damage. Yeah. You're better so, off just letting it go straight through. Right. So radiation, huge problem. And so we can learn a lot about how to deal with radiation by going to the moon first. Also, mm-hmm. so learning to live off the land is another huge thing that we, we need to learn on the moon before we, before we can get to Mars. We have astronauts in space you know, right now on the, on the ISS. We've, we've been to the moon. The, the moon is a thousand times farther than, than the International Space Station. You know, if, we, if you have a problem on the, on the space station, no problem. You just you can get a rocket there in, for, relatively quickly. And even on the moon, if there's a major problem, you're a few days away. But Mars is a completely different beast. You're months away, probably maybe even more than that for worst case scenarios, far worse. So you need to be able to be self-sufficient on, on Mars. And you can test that on the moon. Mm-hmm. For example, like there's plenty of ice on the moon, we can learn to, to use. We can have drinking water, hydrogen, oxygen, rocket fuel. Amazing. Also, regolith. There's lots of different things you could do with the regolith of the moon. So, learning to live off the land on the moon could, could teach us a lot about living off the land on Mars, which would be critical because you're just so amazingly isolated. Never, you know, isolation never experienced by any humans ever before. There's also new technology testing. There's lots of new technologies that are coming out. The new spacesuits that are coming out are pretty amazing. If you look at the Apollo spacesuits, they were designed to last just a few missions. Yeah, that's, that's it. it. A, few, a few moonwalks, and that was it. Uh, they they were like falling apart. They Crumbled. were they were in <laughs> bad shape. Now Artemis and Mars is going to have missions that are going to last a lot more than a few a few days or a week. It's going to be weeks months or even potentially years so yeah. it's a completely different beast so that, so we got to test these new spacesuits there's also vehicles that they're that they're developing that you're going to need on on mars so you're going to test them on the moon on the moon pressurized unpressurized and then there's there's energy sources uh portable nuclear fission, fission systems i've talked about kilopower on the show before there, that project is developing a, a fission system that's 10 kilowatts that could last many many years incredibly beneficial to have a source, a source like that on Mars that could last you for years and you don't have to worry about anything. You don't need solar or, or any other type of fuel. That's going to be critical. All going to be tested on the moon. There's also China competition. China you know, has to go into this. NASA feels that we need to settle the moon in some way before the Chinese. 
they're planning on settling or having Taikonauts on by the year 2030. And the NASA boss, Bill Nelson, said this in a recent interview. He said, we don't want China suddenly getting there and saying, this is our exclusive right. territory. Yep, I mean, you know, that. who knows what's going to happen? I, that wouldn't shock me if they did that. But they want, they feel that they need a presence there before there could be any, any reasonable kind of claim that another country could have. Plus, this whole space between the uh, moon and the Earth the cis lunar space is going to be a huge competition, a mm-hmm. hugely strategically important uh, space that you're going to see China, mainly China and the United States kind of like vying for. That's one of the one of the reasons why we're really seriously developing uh, nuclear rockets now, because you need to have mobility in cis lunar space. And that's, that's a, and I love the fact that we're moving away from chemical rockets, but I hate the reason why we're doing it. But NASA is not stupid. They're, they're involved in these nuclear rockets because they feel that once NASA develops them or once the, government's, uh, the government uses them for cislunar space, they can then take that as the foundation, foundational rocket that they could improve and use them to go to Mars. Mm-hmm. Great, great, great. I love it. You, uh, so Chinese uh, astronauts are actually called Ty- taikonauts? Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. I like Tycho. Tycho. Cosmonauts is cool. Tychonauts is cool. I guess astronauts is cool too. We're just used to it here. Right. It's, it's like, like, yeah, yeah. It's outdated. yeah. yeah I cool. like it. And then the other, the other huge reason is just science, just going to the moon for just pure science. And it's not just Tang science, right? Mm. It's not just that. <laughs> uh, astronaut Jessica Meir said, uh, the samples that we collected during the Apollo missions changed the way we view our solar system. I think we can expect that from the Artemis program as well. Obviously, there's going to be tons and tons of new science coming out of these of these missions over over the next 20 years. The, the science that's going to flow from the moon back down to Earth is going to be mm-hmm. it's going to be amazing. It's unpredictable. Who knows what we're going to find? But we're always surprised with stuff like that. And if if, if history is any any precedent, I think. Uh, we're going to be even more amazed at what we discover on the moon from just a purely science perspective. So there's so many reasons to go to the moon first. And I think it's not just going to be a, a training platform for Mars. It's going to be a, there's going to be a human settlement there. For, and there's lots of amazing things that could be done on the moon. Uh, there's so much we can learn and experience there that we can't on, on the Earth. And I think we just need to go Bob, there. We've talked before about the moon being the stepping stone to Mars. So is that Absolutely. still, is that still totally. it, but is that still the case in a physical sense? Like we're going to yeah. launch the Mars mission from the moon. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So. And that's one thing I wanted to cover also, the, the gateway station that, that's going to be orbiting the moon. That, that, that station um, is, is, you know, it's going to be integral to the Artemis mission. And, and it's going to be, it's a way station. They're going to, you know, astronauts are going to ferry from that station to the moon, but it's also going to then be used as a way, as a waypoint for going to Mars. Mm-hmm. Um, the big reason for that is the rocket equation, right? Chemical, you don't want yeah. to do one long trip if you can avoid it. If you could break a long trip up into multiple smaller trips, that's always much better. You know, the rocket equation essentially is that you need the fuel to carry the fuel to carry the fuel. And so it, mm-hmm. it the amount of fuel you need for any trip, like if you, you could calculate, I want to go to from point A to point B in this amount of time, right? And that includes getting out of a gravity well. You can calculate how much fuel you need Time is important because like we, you can go really far if you don't care if you get there in 20,000 years. You don't need a lot of fuel. Um, but if you want to get to Mars you know, in a, in a, without overexposing your astronauts to cosmic rays, you want to get there as fast as possible. So actually most of the energy to get from the Earth to Mars is still just getting just out getting of the out Earth's, Earth. Earth's gravity well. So if you can get to the moon, You've already used a chunk of your, a big chunk of your fuel, but you're not carrying the fuel to get the Mars right. off of Earth, right? You're only going to carry it firing from the moon. So that's a no brainer. We get to the moon. We've already spent most of our energy going yeah. anywhere, mm-hmm. anywhere in the solar system. You've already spent most of your energy going from the Earth to the moon. And then the moon really becomes our launching pad for everywhere else. Right. That's the system that we have to get to. Assuming right? you're not going to be accelerating all the way or halfway to Mars, you know. And imagine it's still, we, it's still a chemical rocket. Imagine so you if can't we're, be we're using the, whole way. the moon's regolith to make the rocket fuel. The well, that's the thing. Or, or, or even the ice. The in ice, situ resources. Hydrogen, yeah. That, oxygen. Yeah. Is yes. it, did you say in situ? I thought it was in situ. It depends if you're carrying There's multiple ways to pronounce it. I say in situ, like situation. <laughs> situ, yeah. It, yeah. I find that scientists 
and or sorry, I find that physicians tend to say situ and scientists tend to say situ. We're which scientists, is kind of so I'm wrong either way. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know, but like I know what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. I oh, forget you can say you. situ. You, you can that sounds a little weird, but you can say it. Yeah. No judgment. Paraserolophus. Yeah, thanks, Kara. I can't when you say that word, my brain literally gets about a quarter of the way through it and then shuts down. Para. So much <laughs> All right, but Bob, so here's the here's the devil's advocate question. Oh boy. Ooh. Like you say, oh, we need to go to the moon in order to get to Mars, but you're just sort of kicking the can down the road. Like, why go to Mars then? The the big well, we know this, we've talked about this before. The big devil's advocate question is, why not just have robots do everything? Why put mm-hmm. people there at all? Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, like humans are explorers. Yeah. It's it's part of the the way that we operate, and there is something romantically profound about traveling the universe. So right? romance. Is no, but it's it is the human condition, though. You know, like yeah, if you want to just look at it by the numbers, sure, we send we send machines, machines can do science there and all that. But you know, as, as romantic as this sounds, what was cooler than putting people on the moon that humans have done? So I agree with you, but I I think we need to go deeper because that's not enough. Cool I think factor. to sell it to say why we need to spend an order of magnitude more money to send people to do what robots could do much cheaper. Let's put that money into building better robots so that they'll be better able to. Yeah. So to the do question the boils things. down to is what can a person do that a robot can't do? Well, that's a well, that's one question. Yeah. That's not the question. That's one question, and that's you know it remains to be seen because right now, yes, if you had a human scientist with instruments on Mars, they could react to what they're discovering plan a follow-up experiment you know what i mean they could do that all right there you don't have to say oh now we need to design another rover and in 20 years we'll be able to do the follow-up experiment to Mm -hmm. what we just discovered but of course you know the the co-argument is well well robots will get better to do that but i think okay sure but we'll also get better at putting people into space at Mm -hmm. the same time and Mm -hmm. as you know again as we mentioned previously when we're talking about the book we will be robots going into the space, right? At we some will point, genetically yeah. engineer ourselves and we'll be cyborgs and whatever. So it's should, should we send people or robots into space? The answer is yes. Both. We'll send both, we'll be both. And I think <laughs> you know, developing the technology to have biological organisms um basically inhabit the universe, mm-hmm. I think is a reasonable goal. Because if we don't we're limited to this one planet forever. And at some point, we need to, you know... We're going to be... break it beyond repair at some point. Yeah. But even without that concern, even I don't think... See, I don't, see, that's, that's not my argument. My argument yeah. is that we're going to destroy the Earth, so we've got to go elsewhere. I'm hoping that we don't destroy the Earth. Well, I don't sh- think we're going to. I think eventually... We may make it shitty for a while, but I think, you know, as technology advances, et cetera, Earth's always going to be the home of humanity. Um, so even that argument aside, why wouldn't we want to spread out into our own solar system? There's so much to do out there. There's so many resources. There's just so much to learn, so much science to do. And why should robots have all the fun? Yeah. I also think and that we want the, the ability to have human civilization spread to other locations. Yeah. You know, uh, there's, there's hundreds of billions of suns in our, in our own galaxy. And we have no idea how common life is. What if we're the only sentient race in the galaxy? It's a lot of space out there, you know, oh, that, yeah, that, that we could expand thought. into. Um, I <laughs> like we could have a whole planet, Steve. We could have a whole planet where cows could just go crazy. Yeah, just go for it. Cow planet. Yeah. Well, we already <laughs> cow we got planet. Delta. Mars is a robot planet. True. A robot oh planet. yeah. I, you know, when you say that, when you talk about like the fact that humans one day will merge with our technology and machines, like I, I totally agree with you. Okay, we're joined now by Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut. Tim, let's get right to some questions. So what do you think about the Artemis program and the space launch system? I think, okay, so, I mean, in <laughs> general, I'm very happy about Artemis. And I think it's it's a, an important step to finally start exploring beyond low Earth orbit again for the first time in, you know, almost 50 years. Yeah. Which is just crazy to think about. Like we we literally fifty years ago, you know, we were doing stuff that we just haven't done since, and that just it feels so backwards to me. It feels like, uh, you know, like humans are have gone backwards in time almost. Um, so I personally am a really big fan of anything that that even if it's a slow march forward, at least you know goes in that direction. And the Artemis program is is 
you know, for better or worse, kind of uh, currently revolving around the SLS rocket and the Orion capsule. And although those are, you know, over budget and, and slow programs in general, I am still a big fan of the fact that, you know, it survived three administration changes now. And uh, yeah. that's a big deal. And then uh, that they're also working with commercial partners for things like the Lunar Lander, the Eclipse missions, that which will be uh, just Lunar Explorers, you know, little... It, so it's heavily rooted in, you know, in these commercial partners. And I think it's just set up in a way that will go more and more that way. But for now, you kind of have that backbone of having the option of humans getting on a more traditional rocket right. and a more mm-hmm. traditional. And, and at mm-hmm. least it's like a, we know at least this is going to be progressing forward. And we know, like, even if it's slow, at least like it's, it's moving. It is moving, you know? Yeah, we have to separate the Artemis mission from the SLS launch system. The Artemis mission is the mission to go to the moon and do what they want to do on the moon. The SLS launch system is what they're using to get there. Yeah. But that doesn't mean they always have to use the SLS. Yeah. I mean, we're kind of committed for now because we've already yeah. dumped yeah. a lot of money into it and it's it's ready. It's on the launch pad. You know, I had to skirt the the hurricane. But other than that, they're they're, <laughs> they're ready to go. But I agree. I mean, it does look like – I know like, like just a few – I mean, you probably heard about this, probably even wrote about it. Like the NASA is – soliciting more submissions for lunar landers. You know, I know that they already did they they officially contract with SpaceX to use Yes. Yeah. Yes, as of last year I think they were the sole procurement out of three options last year. But they but they're was, they're asking for more. They want more options. They do and they they originally most people thought they would down select to two. So it was actually a pretty big shock when they only were able to select um SpaceX and most of that was because of the price. You know, SpaceX was by far the cheapest option, despite being um, almost 100 times more capable than the, than the next options or, or 10 times more capable than the next Why options. Why was that? How were they able to do it so cheaply? Their Starship vehicle is just so absurdly, so much larger, bigger, more. It's just a way bigger platform. And, you know, the, the scale at which not only they're building, but even manufacturing things is just kind of on a whole different. It's a whole different ballgame. I mean, the, the Raptor engines, they're. I, I don't even I can't keep track of how many they built already. It's it's over a hundred. It might even I don't even remember. It might be like wow. 150 or something. Really? And that's an engine that really just started doing stuff about three years ago. So in rocket terms, this is like insane pace that I mean they're building almost one a day at this point. Yeah, and it's Literally. also yeah. deliberately designed to be cheap and reusable. I mean, yeah. at one point Musk said we could use like a carbon polymer and that would be lighter and everything, but you know, steel's really cheap. And so they're they're just building out of you know high grade steel of the right kind you know to, for the, what they needed for and steel is still a great material you know it, it, mm-hmm. so but but the but the the choice was because it's che- the cheapest thing that will get the job done right so but shouldn't shouldn't every rocket be utilizing that kind of mentality well should we be the, trying the, to make everything cheap? the difference between a private company and the government is profound yeah <laughs> right is red tape you know when it's you think about like what yeah. what um. SpaceX has been able to achieve just in the idea of reusability, just in that concept alone. Mm-hmm. The reusability saves – I mean it's going to easily save trillions of dollars down the road. It's, it's, a, it's but massive. But the messed up thing is like it's a private company that's just using this public funding. <laughs> so it's like this weird thing where the money coming in is the same. There's still taxpayer dollars coming in. But then they're able to do everything without the kind of government regulation and bureaucracy. There's just kind of two things that are that are a little bit different, specifically about the, the. So basically, SpaceX would be doing Starship with or without the government at all, with or without a dollar from NASA. Um, as a matter of fact, they're actually beyond matching their contribution to the lander is substantially more than NASA's <laughs> contribution, which is really backwards. And it's because SpaceX really believes that this is going to be their commercial platform to make. You know, this is their this is their bread and butter now. This is going to make it so their Falcon 9, which is already the cheapest, most prolific mm-hmm. launch vehicle right now, will look like a child's toy because it will be able to be five to ten times more capable and fully reusable. So it could bring the cost down by an order of magnitude or more. Is that so match they, overall or is it just for this project? Because, I, I mean, like money's fungible. They take a lot of money from NASA, do they not? Yeah, they've, they've won a lot of contracts from NASA. Yeah. And so and, overall, like what percentage of their of their funding well, is... Elon Musk had to finance SpaceX for years through failure yeah, yeah, without... Yeah, that's any, true. So that, that, the, the startup costs almost bankrupted him. But he's like, keep going, keep going. We'll get there eventually. So it'd be interesting to see the accounting overall yeah. over all this time. So now. I can but, give you a sense of that. $4.3 billion was basically the original contribution from NASA to win... 
is is how they got the Falcon Nine developed and the the Dragon capsule originally developed was because and then they were they were trying to get out of they they originally were flying the Falcon One when they finally did launch it on their fourth attempt and made it to orbit that was like every penny was in already like a hundred percent every single you know per private dollar and, and investors dollars were one hundred percent in on that rocket if that rocket failed SpaceX would not be a thing anymore mm-hmm. because they won that they ended up winning another other contracts and they then they were able to uh the first commercial it was at the time it was cot cots program uh commercial orbital transportation services which turned into the crs commercial resupply missions and so they were one of at first three one of the companies failed uh, north of grumman is still the other company that's procuring and and resupplying the international space station currently and then again that that went into a, another round which is the commercial crew program which is what we're in now with the crew dragon capsule and Boeing Starliner is the other option that still has not yet to date flown people. Um, and the big thing there is, you know, Boeing won almost two times as much money as SpaceX, uh, most of it for timeline assurance purposes. And despite that, they still haven't flown anyone to date mm-hmm. and SpaceX Yikes. has sent, they're all, we're about to send their fifth crew to the International Space Station already. Wow. Yeah. wow. So, so if you were to put like a, I mean, you probably can't do this quick and dirty on the back of a napkin, but if you were to put like a percentage of like how much of SpaceX overall, their, um, their revenue has been self-funded by Elon himself, has been other contracts like purely commercially gained and then coming in from NASA, would you say it's like a third, a third, a third? So we can count. So they, they do three to four, about four resupply missions each year with NASA and they do they're basically doing every six months with direct crew dragon. So there's six missions a year. And then every now and then they win things like Lucy and a few other things. So probably eight or nine launches are NASA launches. Most, most of the time. And those are, you know, those are at cost plus contracting. No, those are, I mean, uh fixed price contracting. So a, a bid. Um, and then these days though, SpaceX is going to be launching probably pretty close to 60 launches this year. Holy. The is that vast- from Starlink? most of it's Starlink. Yeah. Okay. And Probably. so that's, is that making them bank right now? Or are they still self-funding that and hoping to see still the money on the back Still self-funding it gotcha. and seeing it as like, well, now it's going to be this kind of backbone for so much of mm-hmm. of the internet. I mean, you know, already mm-hmm. we're seeing T-Mobile wanting to use Starlink to be able to um, use a little bit of their little slice of, of bandwidth to be able to basically make it so any T-Mobile customer can potentially use their phone anywhere. Mm-hmm. I have a lot um, of friends who are living in like rural parts of Europe who are already Starlink subscribers because yeah. it's like just it's so much better than anything they had previously. Yeah, yeah, it's and it's it's just the beginning. You know, the, this is like the Starlink literally 1.0 or 1.5, um, and these Starlink 2.0 satellites that are meant to launch on Starship, which is the big reason why they're pushing for Starship. Uh, mm-hmm. is to get these much bigger, much more capable satellites. And that will be what's completely changes the game on, right. on all of this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Fascinating. Cellular. So they really want, they really want the, mm-hmm. uh, the starship to be their heavy lift rocket. Yeah. And it's going to take over. I mean, as soon as that thing's flying regularly, of course there'll be some, you know, some missions are just too vital to put on anything other, like, you know, if a, a no department of defense satellite. mission, <laughs> exactly, exactly. If there's a military satellite or something that's already been, designed and built and is and paid for a Falcon heavy uh, launch, it's going to be on a Falcon heavy launch or a Falcon nine launch. There's going to be a handful of those. So you'll see it taper off though, because obviously the price price wins out at some point, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, new customers will very quickly be signing up for, for starship. Mm-hmm. And they actually already have, like there's already customers. That's how far along they think they are. SpaceX and their customers believe, you know, we're within like earshot of starship actually being an operational rocket. Uh, to me, it feels like, We'll probably see some big booms here. We'll see some some big failures as they test. The, you know, just the way they test things is like it's good enough to see if we can get data out of it and see if you know, yeah. does it survive this initial phase? Can it survive reentry? And it will be a little while before I think we see it be operational and be something that you know is flying important payloads other than their own just Starlink stuff because they don't care if they blow up their own Starlinks. It's not a big deal. But I think it's going to be you know probably two years before we see two to three years before we see Starship really like becoming a routine thing like Falcon Nine is now. That'll be fantastic. I mean, it's just good to have multiple companies that have the infrastructure, you know, because there'll be competition, which will help the price go down. And then the more companies that are building it, you know, they're building spacecraft, the whole spacecraft industry will become less expensive. Just it'll be more ubiquitous and it'll be a part of everyday life. You know, 60 launches mm-hmm. is so many launches. When you think about like 20 years ago, if we talked about a company launching 60 launches in one year, that number just seems way too high. You know, but yeah. it, it isn't. It, it's happening, and it, and we're lucky that it's there. Mm. 
and next year they're going for a hundred. And I absolutely believe it. I think, you know, two years ago, if you said, you know, if Elon goes, we're going to do a hundred launches, I'd be like, yeah, oh, this is like the most hilariously optimistic Elon thing he could have ever said. But now I told, when they say they're going to do a hundred launches, seeing their pace now, it's like, yeah, they can absolutely probably do a hundred next year. That was a good Elon impression. <laughs> <laughs> and the SLS is one per year. One per year at best. And between Artemis one and Artemis two, which will be the first time they put crew on board. Uh, it'll be two years. Mm-hmm. There's a two year gap. Yeah. And oh some God. of that is because uh, the, the vehicle, I think at this point, the SLS will be ready. The next SLS will be ready, but um, they're actually reusing some of the avionics from mm-hmm. the Orion capsule. Yeah. Oh. So, um, so it's not like they're relying on it. Cause I guess they do have another set of avionics that they had to, you know, take it off from Artemis three and bring it on board or whatever. But that is actually one of the turnaround things is it takes 20 months between splashdown and having, the Artemis II Orion capsule be ready with that set of avionics. That's my, that's so, mind blowing when you compare wow. that what SpaceX is doing. Mm-hmm. It's like SpaceX is an order of magnitude more fleet of foot and capable, you know. And I, I just feel like even though we've dumped a ton of money into it, like they're gonna they are Two going to be shifting over to to SpaceX and whatever other company is going to be out there because NASA just doesn't have the infrastructure. I guess they just don't have the the bandwidth to do what SpaceX is doing. Well, NASA shouldn't. NASA, you know, NASA mm. should not be developing and operating a rocket. Just like the FAA does not operate aircraft. You know, the yeah. FAA is not out there with our own like imagine if they ran FedEx and had to run American Airlines Wouldn't and work. Delta like Wouldn't work. it would be terrible. If they developed their own airplanes and had to operate them and it it'd be Can't it'd be it. terrible, you yeah. know, like yeah. And that's and that's what basically what NASA had had to do in the past just because there weren't commercial options. It was too big of an investment up front. You know, we're talking about billions and billions of dollars to get, especially like, you know, we, we see small set launchers like, you know, Rocket Lab, Firefly, Astra, you know, all these new small set launchers. But they're, you know, they're maybe in like the hundreds of millions of invest initial investment to get a, a, or, a small orbital rocket. But to get an orbital rocket capable of carrying people, to certify it for human spaceflight, all of these things. I mean, we're talking in the billions and we just didn't have, you know, there wasn't the funding for that, you know, 10, 20 years ago. So it was an evil, a necessary evil, really, for NASA to be doing the ones building and designing and operating rockets. But it's just not, the, they shouldn't be doing that anymore. I'd much rather my taxpayer dollars get spent towards science missions and exploration and Earth, you know, Earth sciences and things like that. And I think, you know, they're better off being a customer to yeah, a commercial. For sure. Yeah, yeah. Now, the, the, the Starship can go to the moon, right? I mean, if it, it's big enough. That it could launch off the Earth and go to the moon after refueling in orbit. It has to refuel in orbit, and yes, is that going to be possible? When's that? When is that going to be possible? I guess I should say that's like one of the very first things they're going to have to figure out because obviously with the Artemis program they're relying on this vehicle being able to land on the moon. So yeah. you have right there, you know, you have <laughs> one of their big contracts for the thing is relying on this orbital refueling, and orbital refueling has not been done with cryogenics at this scale at all. I don't know if it's actually ever if there's been cryogenic transfer really between two vehicles ever so that's one of the things they have to test out yeah. and initially it's going to be just literally transferring it between two different tanks between yep. the header tank yeah. and the main tank then they actually want to contract for that as well so yeah so it does require it has such a heavy dry mass you know it's carrying around those flaps and all the, and the heat shield all that stuff taking that out to the moon is not the most efficient way to get to the moon uh but you can brute force it by refueling and bit. and the using the starship as a lander that they're just going to get a couple of the starships to like to lunar orbit and keep them there to go up and down from the moon. Is that the idea? So it's, a, it's still actually quite confusing, honestly, even yeah. for me. Um, huh. So they, they're making a bespoke version of starship that does not have, you know, landing or does not have the big flaps and a heat shield. because You'll never need it if you're just, you know, between the earth moon system and, and never coming back, but I'm still not entirely sure how it gets from on the moon back into lunar orbit. And how, how, when's it exactly hook up with the Orion capsule how is it refuel? Where is it refuel? I mean, I, these are the things that we hope to learn in the near future, you know? Yeah, I've, I've been able to wrap my head around it either. I have so, so many questions that I can't find the answers to anywhere. Well, what does that tell you that the answers don't seem to be out there? That, 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 ready that they're probably as, almost as clueless as we are about how it's going to be solved? That's, that's scary. I think <laughs> there's – well, there's definitely like a lot of um, – you know, especially the way SpaceX does things that they're – they don't – typically go too far into the, I mean, obviously they have big aspirations like let's land on Mars. That's ridiculous for now, but you know, they're really looking at what can we do 
absolute next step. You know, like right now it's like, let's try to get our full stack off the ground. Yeah. It might blow up soon after it leaves the ground, but we want to get all 33 Raptor engines firing and fly. And so for them, I think that's literally like most of the companies just focusing on that one thing, especially if you're on the Starship program. And then, you know, from there you can, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to get ahead of yourself, like the waterfall method of computer programming, where you don't want to get like 10 steps ahead, because what if step three changes and you have a big change and all that work you did on step 10 is now negated. I was wondering, you know, thinking about that, a ship that big, to me, you know, craft landing on the moon, they're small and they're very dodgy, you know, like, but they want to land a big spaceship on the moon. Tim, do you know, are they going to actually have to build like a stable launch pad for this thing to land on? That's not currently in the plans as far as I know. The only people that I know was working on some, I think, was it actually Mastin? Maybe my Discord will remind me, but someone was actually working on a system that would, uh, you basically inject into the exhaust plume of your rocket engine. You would eject like a, a concrete, basically. What? And it, at, oh. as it like is landing, it's literally Drop creating its pad. own landing Holy pad. Moly. That wow. is freaking science Never fiction awesome. And if they could do that, <laughs> could you imagine? That was the theory. And I, unfortunately, Masson just went under. And Masson had some of the coolest engineers and some of the coolest ideas, in my opinion. So I'm really sad that they, that well, they Someone else under. will grab those people and hopefully just, yes. bring them into their fold. Exactly. I did read something where they were talking about having to create some type of landing gear for the moon that was specific, like SpaceX was saying that. But then it, it hit me like, yeah, but what are we talking about? Because that's a big ship. It's very different. It's a very different landing feat, you know, like on the moon. The other thing too is like, you know, historically we didn't land where we said we were going to land on the moon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lucky they landed. So on. 11 seconds of fuel. Yeah. Left. Yeah. Yeah. Seven, I think. <laughs> Just a few more seconds. So there's a, there's a few things there. Um, that A lot of the landing stuff, that's why the CLIPS missions, the commercial Leo something, something partner systems or whatever, their job is to literally like scout out the landing spots first. And they're going to be sent off to, I think there's a, there's a lot of them. I think, I don't remember how many, like almost half a dozen or something like that, at least, um, that are all different lunar landers that will be checking out different landing spots all in the South pole of the moon. Uh, so hopefully that it gives, you know, scientists uh, a lot better sense of actually where they're landing, if it's safe to land, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, map out some of the topography a little bit more accurately. Uh, but with Starship, so the thing is right now, the normal Starship is kind of like a whole fleet of potential rockets. You know, you have the normal Starship that's going to be deploying satellites or whatever in low Earth orbit. You'll have, a, you know, a resupply version of Starship. You'll have uh, potentially a, a, an expendable version of Starship for like going to Jupiter or something where the upper stage is just expended. But the, the lunar lander specifically will have huge, will have to have big landing gear with a pretty wide stance because this thing is, you know, 150, wait, uh, 50 meters tall, sorry. Yeah, so yeah. 165 feet tall. So it's so, you know, that's that's high center of mass uh, with, you know, the crew crew cabin up top. So it's, you definitely have to have a way to have a wide stance and be able to level it out. And the other consideration for a long time, they were talking about having thrusters, the landing engines actually on the top of the rocket so that it diffuses the uh, the exhaust and doesn't create like a giant crater. With exactly. The yeah. Because that, those engines would, it would blast well, the, the hell out of the surface. All over the place. And how do they get yeah. down from the crew cabin at the top to, to 165 feet down to the moon? They just jump out. <laughs> <laughs> and in a few minutes, they land. See, one six gravity. It'd be like falling from like 10 meters. Yeah, you know, it's, no, uh, that's not gonna work. Um, there's Pretty actually cute. a huge elevator. Like literally uh, the concepts that we've seen is like the side of it opens up and there's a giant just cargo elevator. That's and cool. Yeah, that's cool. Oh my god! Take I hope that down. they send a, a ship with a camera so we could watch that whole thing happen. Like man. a conveyor is, belt, you clip yourself to a conveyor belt; it will carry you down. I would imagine that is 1950s I mean, science fiction. That is so awesome. Like it this. is. Oh, it man. is. It's like retro future almost because, like that, you know, that's what we envisioned was it would have these massive ships that have like cranes and all these you know cool things and just deploy stuff on the moon is no big deal. And I, 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 that's when you have this size and the scale of a vehicle you're talking about, that literally is kind of the stuff that you have to employ. Yeah. And at the, and at the end of the game, like at the end of the day, that, that's relatively primitive, like a, an elevator. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's, Sounds that's like, a yeah. pretty primitive thing, yeah. but obviously that elevator needs to work, yeah. <laughs> you know, in the lunar environment with, with dust and regular, and all that stuff. Yeah. 
I oh, guess man, the backup system would or be... is it like all high tech? Like, couldn't crank. they just do like a cranky crank crank? Hopefully they have like a backup, like a manual backup. I'm yeah. guessing, but I'm not, no details have been talked about at all. Do <laughs> you some, imagine some renders. <laughs> they get all the way there and a freaking elevator doesn't work? Right? Well, well, you just yeah, repel, like, you sure, just, sure, just sure, repel yeah. down the side of the ship. You're good. Well, here's the real question. Will the elevator have Muzak while they're yeah, descending? Of course. Oh, gosh, yes. <laughs> it better, it better. Automatically sinks Bluetooth and it's just some, yeah, <laughs> just horrible Muzak. That'd be awesome. So, Tim, we, we um, invited you on. Another reason was, we, you know, we have a new book coming out. I can't wait. So there are some chapters in here that I think you'll be interested in that we wanted to uh, to discuss with you. So, Steve, what, what would be the top one? Well, I mean, you know, we have a whole section on space travel. So anything in there would <laughs> now here. So here's a question that we address uh, in the book. Now, I don't know how much you get into the future of space travel, like beyond existing technology, but we'd spend a lot of time thinking about that. What's the infrastructure going to look like, not only in 10 or 20 or 50 years, which we, what we've been talking about, but then where do we go from there and where do we go from there? So what I don't know. Have you thought about that much? Like, what, what do you where do you think we're headed? Like, when we're zipping around the solar system, what kind of ships are we going to be using? What would you say? Do you want like a ten, ten, fifty, and yeah, hundred year prediction? Yeah, ten, fifty, yeah. and hundred, okay. perfect. And, and then okay. a, then a thousand year prediction start. <laughs> and okay. <go. laughs> ten year. I think in the big thing, the big hurdle right now is just getting the cost of getting to space down. Period, and that is happening. So I think in 10 years, hopefully the idea of, of putting something into LEO, into low Earth orbit, you know, even if it's a large, you know, new space station is not so insane that it's just, you know, in, impossible with our capital now. Um, so that opens up the doors of, of heavier and heavier, uh, you know, bigger, heavier things. You can have cheap space hotels, you know, cheap being still yeah. hundreds of millions, but not like billions, you know, you know, things like that will open up. But I think that even makes it so uh, as Bob might have whispered under his breath nuclear engines mm -hmm. i would i would love to see uh if there is a resurgence of of nuclear capabilities both the united states and the soviet union fully developed uh nuclear rocket engines they're amazing <laughs> there's no reason we shouldn't be using them especially it doesn't make a ton of sense in the earth moon system but as soon as you leave earth uh, uh, well... a nuclear rocket engine <laughs> well, from, from what i've read though there, there's a real push now for nuclear rockets in the cislunar space because that is such a strategic space and with China is trying to do it as well. And, and there, from what I've read, the idea is that, you, you know, if something happens, you need to move a lot of mass very quickly to a different space in, within cislunar space. And chemical rockets are just not going to be able to handle that. And you need something like a nuclear rocket to move, a, say, a big satellite from there to there. The plan, I mean, you're right. We have done a lot of research in the 60s and 70s. We had it. We, we had the rockets. We were, they were being tested. But now they're really, if they're developing them now and plan on having test beds in orbit, you know, in, in this decade, they're really pushing for it. And it's really the push for cis -lunar, control of cislunar space. The big problem with nuclear rockets, though, is uh, there's, well, there's two things. They, they run on hydrogen and obviously liquid hydrogen. Uh, the, it has no oxidizer. All you're doing is you're heating up hydrogen with, uh, you know, with nuclear fission. Hydrogen likes to boil off. So you really can't, it's not great for long-term if you're trying to sit it on a satellite for decades. Uh, it's going to take a lot of energy just to keep that hydrogen in a liquid state. It's going to mm. want to boil off in a hurry. Mm. So, right. uh, you know, it, it's it's really uncommon to have, you know, like there's ACES upper stage and a few other upper stages that are looking into like literally having basically a an internal combustion engine that just sits there and recondenses the hydrogen constantly on orbit. But, you know, it's also really heavy. The the yep. Nerva engine that the United States developed yep. was so heavy, the only vehicle that could lift it into orbit and the stage accompanying it was the Saturn V. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it we'll, was yeah we'll be using huge. chemical rockets for launching for a long time. It's oh, just yeah. it, The thrust is just off the hook and... And uh, nuclear rockets, you know, you know, I haven't seen any plans on using nuclear rockets for an actual launch system. Usually they spew yeah, out no. too much radiation. Yeah. But what about resupplying if, if, if hydrogen boil off is an issue? I mean, I would think just resupplying that uh, in cislunar orbit somewhere between Earth moon system just to, to resupply that seems feasible. The, the big thing, like I think, in my opinion, um, nuclear will be great for sending large, you know, get just get a bigger rocket out to your cislunar system. Or get a, big, a bigger satellite, you know, like it'll do the translunar injection, no problem. You know, you can lift, say, two to three times more mass because you're using a nuclear engine as your right. kick stage to get out there. But then ditch that big heavy thing 
you have way more, you use a, a storable propellant, you know, like a, a bi-propellant, something that's hydrazine based or something can last decades, like right. Voyager, you know, and or use, you know, Xeon, use ion thrusters because ion thrusters are, are even more efficient. You know, we're talking mm-hmm. super thousands efficient, but... of seconds of specific impulse instead of yeah. high 800s, 900s. Yeah, but the acceleration, so just... the acceleration sh- is shit. I mean, you don't want to, you can't, be, you can't move a lot of mass quickly. Which, which with using an ion engine, right? You can't, that's just not going to happen. I mean, the thrust is like the equivalent. What's the iconic example? A piece of paper on your finger. That's the kind of acceleration, but it builds up and builds up. And over weeks yeah. and months, you can have tremendously efficient and you can attain a, a, a lot of a pretty intense velocity. But my understanding of cislunar space is you need to move a lot of mass fast and nuclear rockets, they say, is the way to do it into something. So what do you uh, think about a hundred years from now? <laughs> okay. How about, so 50, a little bit like more near future. I think we'll just see, you could potentially just see huge, huge, huge things in space. Uh, I think, you know, nuclear will be great. I think rotation detonation engines are another thing we'll see in the relatively near future. Ah. Those are basically engines that don't, you know, like ro- rocket engine doesn't actually have any explosions. It's all just a deflagration. It's all a uh, high energy gas high pressure, hot gas that's flowing really quickly through a D-Lavelle nozzle. But a, a rotation detonation engine literally takes and detonates fuel intentionally, but it propagates in, in a circle, this detonation continually, almost around like a, an aerospike, which is another level of mine. And uh, that makes it so it can be substantially more efficient and makes it so the exhaust is coming out already at hypersonic velocities. Mm-hmm. So it's, or potentially a hypersonic thing. So it's, that was it would be a technology I'd love to see. But I think by then, you know, just, hanging out in space I, I just really think in 50 years we'll definitely have some substantial like it won't be a big deal to go to space but i think it's only the, i think we're still going to be using scaled up cheaper versions of what we see today mm. basically i don't think in 50 years we're going to have some huge breakthrough yet i think it's still going to be i mean physics is physics and until we figure something out you know we're just going to be kind of using bigger cheaper so, uh more commercially available so, options of what so we chemical rockets so for that. the next 50 years chemical rockets still yeah. i hope not i hope you're wrong because i i'm hoping for a bunch bigger well, a nuclear, nuclear engine is a, nuclear Price. is a, still a chemical rocket i mean ish it doesn't have a chemical reaction but we're using traditional propellants yeah well it's not okay. like a new... yeah we don't yeah I, I, chemical yeah for, we don't describe it that way because a chemical rocket and then nuclear rocket and then then beyond the that fusion um, yeah, f- yeah, fission, fusion. Yeah, we get, I think we yeah we have to have a, a lot of different kinds of rockets. Everything optimized for its specific function, because rather than trying to have one size fits all, there's just too many specific things we need to do. What do, What do you think of the role of uh, solar or light sails? I, it'd be it'll be uh, interesting if if uh, light sails. You know, things like light sails are exciting. You know, obviously we've, there's a handful that have been flown so far. But, you know, they're really, really, really limited right now. Like, they just – you have to have something insanely massive yeah. and fold out big, mm-hmm. fragile thing just to fly around like a shoebox. You know what I mean? It's 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 really hard to scale that up. Uh, but things like pointing a bunch of lasers, a huge laser array at, like, a reflector and shooting that off, like, to another star or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I hope that's something we see in the next 50 years. Yeah. Be, that's our yeah. best chance to to get there in the next couple of generations is that t- type of, that type of technology. Chemicals not going to do it. No, no, no. That's where definitely not. You got to have some, you know, light propulsion type of thing. And and hopefully in after 50 years, you know, hopefully we have a better understanding of physics and we learn how to potentially exploit physics, you know, or something like that, you know, because I feel like we're still making a lot of discoveries about, you know, our understanding of our place amongst the Mm -hmm. stars, among, you know, all everything, you know, Higgs boson type of things. And who knows, we might finally understand how to open up like a wormhole in a couple of years or something. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah. yeah, that that would be wonderful. Thousand, but, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but how, try yeah, not to like, get my hopes up for that. <laughs> right, I won't be around for it. I won't be around for how, it. How long do you think, think it's going? How long do you think it's going to take us to land a person on Mars? I used to say 2030. I actually thought there's a decent chance that humans would walk on Mars in 2030. I'm starting to get. I'm. Oh boy. I'm getting a bit worn down right now from Scrub City, basically. Um, you know, watching Artemis Scrub, mm-hmm. watching Starship yeah. take longer than yeah. than anticipated. Watching. I mean, just. Things just take a long time. Yeah. So I'm not as optimistic about 2030 anyway, as as optimistic about 2030s I used to be. I think it'll probably be in the 2030s. In the like 2030s. 30, ooh, That'd be nice. Five? Yeah. yeah. Mm. yeah. Okay. That's really, I don't know. That's it sounds a little optimistic, huh? but I hope you're right. It, it really yeah. isn't that far off if you think about it. Yeah. I mean, we're talking about mm-hmm. just over a decade. But that, yeah, that requires a lot of things go well and on time yeah. pretty yeah. much between yeah. now Unexpected and then. delays. We get the James it's, Webb the, syndrome. The tale of the dragon is just hard to predict, though, when you have, you know, it, again, like if you had tried to predict the success of the Falcon 9 r- before they had landed a Falcon 9 in 2015, like July of 2015, 
actually here we go june 2015 when they blew up uh crs7 this is uh i think it was like june 31st or something 2015 uh they they lost a falcon 9 in flight and if you try to predict then like what's 2022 gonna look like i don't think anyone in their mind would have said oh they'll be flying these things 14 times yeah with minimal refurbishment and they'll be flying 60 times that year with the falcon 9 yeah like there's just no way and you know, even trying to predict what's going to happen in five more years from now is just really hard to predict. And, and companies like Rocket Lab too. I mean, they're they're launching. They they had a turnaround time of like fifteen days recently, and they you know, and they're starting to kick butt and ramp up too. So it's just really hard to predict these curves. Yeah. You know, yeah. because it, yeah. it it kind of sneaks up on you, and, and you you could be off by two years, and on either side of that, and be completely off by an order of magnitude. You know, it's yeah, just yeah, yeah. all right. Tim, it was wonderful to have you on the show. Yeah, man, thank You're you. Always, a, you know, a wealth of information. We'll definitely get you back. Definitely want to get you back when, when like Artemis is getting before it, it, <laughs> we're, we have boots on the ground on the moon. But we'll we'll be happy to track the whole thing with you. Thank you, Tim. Well, thank Thanks you again. Guys, Take care, Peace, brother. Yes. Thank you, guys. We'll see you. Let's move on with science or fiction. It's time for science or fiction. Each week, I come up with three science news items or facts, two real and one fake, and then I challenge my panel of skeptics to tell me which one is the fake. For this episode, I have four items. I haven't done that in a very long time, but I had four items. And there's a theme, of course. The theme is past inventions that utterly failed, or past technology that failed to change the future or make it into the future. One of the themes of the book is that you can't, like the future is not inevitable the same way our present wasn't inevitable. It's made by choices that we make individually and collectively. And it's made also by lots of considerations, not just what's the best technology. And so these are just examples, not in the book, so no one has an unfair advantage, just examples of technology that didn't make it through for whatever reason. Okay? And of course, one of these is made up, is not true. So item number one, in 1983, in response to the Sony Walkman craze, Audio Technica, I think it's Technica, yep. released the Sound Burger, a portable record player complete with earbuds. Uh, number two, in 1981, a Swedish company marketed an all plastic bicycle, the Itera, which turned out to be more expensive to produce, but failed mostly because the weak frame made it too wobbly to ride. All right, number three, in the 1930s, architect Bus Buckminster Fuller designed a prefab home designed to be inexpensive, quick to build, and eco-friendly, made mostly out of waste cow bones from the beef industry. And I, number four, in 1964, Klaus Schultz, that's S -H -S -C -H -O -L -Z, of Vienna, invented a phone answering robot. However, its ability was limited to picking up and hanging up the phone. Okay. We're going to go down the row here, starting with you, Evan. Uh, the Sony Walkman one and uh, the Sound Burger. I would like to think that I actually heard about that at some point. Um, I used to be in the audiovisual industry, but I have a feeling it's a conflated memory of some kind. It does sound plausible. There were, I mean, the competition for Walkman at the time absolutely was there. Um, and this is about the time the first, I think, portable CD player was about to come out. So... Uh, there was a lot of lot of stuff going on in the portable audio uh, world then. I totally believe that that one's right. Uh, the next one about the plastic bicycle, never heard about this one before. Doesn't mean anything, but it turned out to be more expensive to produce, but failed mostly because of the weak frame, too wobbly to ride. Well, that sounds like that would be the reason why it would fail. I'm not sure about this one. Something seems a little off here. The third one about Buckminster Fuller. And this prefab home designed to be inexpensive. I had a prefab home once, uh, didn't I? Or one was built in a... Oh, yeah. uh, in a uh, Who built that for you? I think, Jay, uh, you might have had a hand in that. <laughs> it's still standing, so well done. Yeah. <laughs> uh, mostly, That's but, cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, mostly, but this one in the 1930s, mostly out of the waste of cow bones from the beef industry. Not, not totally implausible. I mean, it sounds ridiculous in a, in a certain way, but I don't know that that's necessarily a looking for new material new building materials or different building materials i don't have a problem with that one and the last one about the uh, this is the funniest one 
the robot. You actually, but what are you going to make a, a robot to pick up? And I mean, that's what would happen though. If it, in that time, 1964, you would have a mechanical arm of some kind that would have to do the physical picking up of the phone. Right? You're not reinventing the phone or anything. It's just the, the physical, the physicality of it. So the least, the one I think is the fiction is the plastic bicycle one. Whereas I see some sorts of plausibilities kind of in the other items. This one seems like Stevie might think he made it up out of whole cloth. Okay, Bob. Let's start from the bottom. The the phone answering answering machine in 64. Yeah, I mean, technically possible at that time. But it also makes sense that they wouldn't be able to tap in and really do anything other than pick it up and hang it up. And it doesn't say anything really came of it. So that makes sense because nothing really would have come of that. So I guess I'll say that one's science. Buckminster Fuller. Wow. I mean... Cow bones? I don't know. It, it, it doesn't strike me as something that, oh, no, no way that ever happened. Um, so I'll, maybe I'll just go with that one, but it sounds so bizarre. The plastic bicycle kind of makes sense. The one that um, I had an issue with, the portable record player, I mean, how do you keep it from skipping? You know, I mean, I, I think I, I remember seeing one that was in a car, uh, but that's far different from a portable one, as you say, as you say here. Um, so I think made, this might be a riff off of the one that was designed for a car. And even that one sounds like it would be problematic. Um, but I mean, mm. putting a regular record with a, with a needle on it, that's portable. I mean, I, I don't know how that would be designed in such a way. I mean, would it be such a tight fit that it really just couldn't, the needle couldn't bounce off of it? I don't know. For whatever reason, I'll say this one is fiction is probably wrong. All right. Jay, what about you? All right, to, to answer Bob's question, I would imagine, Bob, that you carry this small record player with you and you just put it down. And then, you know, the whole problem that you said is, uh, is you're not going to be riding like a bicycle while you're playing but it. You're walking gonna... down the street with a walk, walk man is, you know, kind of a critical component to a portable record player. Right, but it doesn't, it yeah, doesn't but it say it's a Walkman. It says say. it's a Soundburger. It's a portable oh. record player, which I took as you take it with you. And you plop it down and you, you go to the record. beach. That, that may very like well a, be, but it does say in response to the Sony Walkman. Yeah, but but why would anybody – But Crazy. I think you're, you're, what you're doing, Bob, is you're, you're saying, well, it's because it's Sony Walkman craze. Like that's almost like the tricky part here. You, there's no way that any kind of record player would perform better. Exactly. Than a cassette, a cassette player. I that's think the I idea think is it's the portability aspect of it. I now <laughs> well, I get you. I get you. Right. Right. That's a reasonable way powered. to interpret it, and mine might be reasonable as well. So we'll yeah. see, won't we? Uh, the the bi plastic bicycle. Of course, somebody made a plastic bicycle. The the next one, um, <laughs> the architect waste cow bones. I'm going to just stop you right there, Steve. I just there, that's there's. It. I always wanted to say that to somebody. There is no way that somebody is was building houses out of cow bones. I think that one is a fiction. No way, no how. Okay, so Bob is the Soundburger, Jay is the cow bones, Evan is the robot. So Kara. No, I'm the uh, uh, bicycle. Oh, you're the Steve. bicycle. All right, so one, two, and three. So Kara, you're up. Go ahead, take it. Take I'm, the last I'm, one. I'm not going to pick the, the <laughs> robot. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> I'm not going to be that spread out. Jay, I have been with you since the beginning. I've been thinking about this a lot. So obviously someone made a plastic bicycle and obviously it was a piece of crap. Um, and of course, you could make a portable record player, whether it was meant to be played on a table or on your hip. Doesn't matter if it was good. You just made it, right? And so, of course, somebody attempted this. And maybe it was good because maybe Jay's reason. It doesn't say made it. It said there. released. Yeah. Released. Okay. They might have sold That's... it too. There, you, there is an entire museum in LA dedicated to crappy products that don't work well that were actually released. Like, I'm not surprised by this. Buckminster Fuller, famously geodesic dome. Yeah. I feel like maybe that's where and Steve's Pauline. trying to go. We're imagining a geodesic dome made out of cow bones. But Mr. Fuller was like a real architect <laughs> who made amazing stuff. And he probably did make prefab houses as early as the 30s. I wouldn't be surprised by that because he was really innovative. I don't think making something out of cow bones is innovative. I think that's rustic. It just doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't fit my impression of him. So to me, that's um, that's got to be the fiction. Wow. All yeah. right, Ian, do we have a, a vote tally from the, the live audience? Oh, it looks like the, mm, the vast majority went with Jay and cow Kara bone. with the, uh, the cowbones. Cow all right, so right. most people, all the rogues and most of the audience think that number four is science. So we'll start there. In 1964, Klaus Schultz of Vienna invented a phone-answering robot. However, its ability was limited to picking up 
and hanging up the phone. Uh, everyone pretty much thinks this one is <laughs> yeah. science. You're going to get us all? And this one is... Say it. Science. This ah. is science. Ah. Yep. Yay. He actually did that. Uh, uh-huh. So yeah, he made up a... He made a We'll talk about it in a second, but he made a robot. All it did was pick the phone up and hang it down. Didn't do anything. Didn't give a message. Didn't take a message. Technically, it's a phone answering machine. It just picked up the the receiver and set it back down. Um, so it's a hang up device. Yeah. So call comes in, hang it up. Yeah, it's a phone not answering <laughs> yeah. machine. I'm not sure what he thought, what utility he thought it would have. Maybe for somebody <laughs> who couldn't physically pick up the phone. And he made like a full robot to do this, not an arm. A full human robot. Why? <laughs> what would be that purpose? It's like Simone Yet. Like all of her cool, shitty robots, just yeah. like for fun. Interestingly, 1964 was the same year that they came out with the tape based answering machine. Oh, interesting. You know, actual answering machine. And it was also the year they came out with Steve. That's true. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Three hours, halfway done. All right, guys. The rest oh of gosh. these I'm going to take in order just so I can go through the pictures oh, in order. Oh, boy. In 1983, in response to the Sony Walkman craze, Audio Technica released the Soundburger, a portable record player complete with earbuds. Bob, you think this was the fiction about what was it, like 20% or so of the audience think this one is, is the fiction. The second and most this prevalent. one is science. Yeah, yeah. So Jay is basically correct. There it is. <laughs> Look the at sound that thing. Burger. Uh, Bob's like, you can't. It you was can't in ride reaction a horse to the Walkman. Thing. Those 45. It was in reaction to the Walkman, which was the diversion. That was the red herring. Because you were. Sp- I wanted you to think, how are you going to walk around with a record Yeah, you player? got me again. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> you, have, you do <laughs> have to put it, it down. <laughs> and that's why it failed. Because you have to put it down on a hard, stable right. surface. So it's not really that. It doesn't replace the walkman in any meaningful way that battery that's gotta be battery powered though it's battery powered that's something it has earbuds here's the thing so it basically failed because of course it did uh but cds were just you know exploding you know know that that turntables that vinyl it has is having a resurgence among millennials Mm, and the younger generation and apparently the sound burger has fantastic sound and it's it's really come into high demand (laughs) recently it's funny i i even loved uh steve that you said it had earbuds i doubt it had earbuds it well that's I what it earbuds said existed no it said oh, it had really? earbuds it had earbuds i didn't make that up like buds yeah i don't even think those existed then yeah i'm looking up when it's not wireless not wireless but not wireless yeah, but they were no i know they had care they had, back back then, they had those they had them in the 60s they had earbuds earbuds transistor radios had earbuds but they were tiny yeah i don't think you can see that was not new there's nothing new about that it had earbuds transistor radios had earbuds too all right that looks like a 45 record only yeah it could play it could play the full ones too the 33s oh my god yeah all right so wait so steve people are buying those up yeah yeah yeah, I'm not surprised. The sound. All right, How many let's are go to number two. In 1981, a Swedish company marketed an all-plastic bicycle, the Itera, which turned out to be more expensive to produce, but failed mostly because the weak frame made it too wobbly to ride. Evan, you think this is the fiction? Yeah, I thought so. This one is science. There it is, the mm. all-plastic Itera. They made a ton of these things, like hundreds of thousands of them whatever no, sure, why not the the idea was they wanted to make a bicycle out of essentially recycled plastic mm-hmm. you know to use up yeah. all the plastic that was that was being created and you know it looks like a bicycle but it just was not strong enough and it was the frame itself would buckle and was wobbly so as it, if they didn't test their own product yeah, before yeah they it's, it's almost as if they didn't engineer they didn't it properly the and and so they basically had to throw out like hundred thousands of these bicycles they were just oh, they had, just had to get rid of them. I guess the, the guy that made the company must have felt great. He's like, I want to take garbage, like plastic. Well, I think he got of- confused by the term recycle when it came to this. So yeah, you know, there you go. Kind of yeah. Became all right, inflation. All um, this means all this means that in the 1930s, <laughs> architect Buckminster Fuller designed a prefab home designed to be inexpensive, quick to build, and eco-friendly, made mostly out of waste Look cow bones. bones from the beef <laughs> industry. Is the fiction? Somebody in the chat already pointed out. That book, Mr. Fuller, and Kara, you said it. He did make a prefab house, the Dymaxion. He made it out of chrome. Oh, cool. Made it out of chrome. Oh, I saw that too. Yeah, yeah and it, you that. could fit the you could fit the components onto one truck. You uh-huh. could assemble it in two days. That's that can't include the site work, but hmm. assuming the site work is done, you could you could assemble it in two days. It failed uh, for for 
you know, from well, what I'm reading. Of course it failed. Look at the miserable expression on that guy in the house. It, it I mean, failed guy, in two for well, two reasons that I that I read. Right? It can't take a 75 mile an hour wind. Well, chrome will rust. No, <laughs> no, chrome is too expensive. If, you, if it gets chipped, I mean, if if it gets chipped. Be, yeah. yeah, is it too expensive? No, it was not. It was cheap, too quick, round. easy to build, uh, easy to and quick to build. Uh, it was too round. Thank you, Lou. Because wow, people couldn't, joking. they couldn't find furniture that would fit well with the round design. Oh my god! <laughs> but also, it just, how do you hang those those uh, window? Covers yeah, yeah, right. Like how do you hang bar. a picture on the wall? <laughs> and also, it was just too small. Like the 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 bathrooms were teeny, teeny, tiny, and the bedrooms there was like two very small bedrooms. So oh, people just thought it was too thing. small. It, the shape was too inconvenient to adapt to, and so it never took off. For those reasons. But yeah, but that he designed it to be an eco-friendly, prefab, easy to build home. And so I, ha- I, you know, when I was coming up with the idea of this as the fix, it's like, okay, I'll just have to come up with something else he made it out of that's not true. And it took me like seven tries <laughs> to find something that doesn't exist as, a, as an actual house. So people build houses out of cardboard. Mm-hmm. That, but of course, it's like specially engineered to be as strong as wood. Peanut shells, yep. recycled glass bottles. Sure. Right? I mean, I just, I've seen that. Seashells. I had to go through all of these before I wound up. I couldn't find anyone making houses out of bones. So I figured probably because of the creep factor. Bone is actually a good, strong, lightweight material and, and yeah. relatively Seemed plausible evolution. and not that combustible. So it's, yeah, it's. Yeah, a, I mean, if you turned it into like a pulp and then. I'm well, sure right, that's what it. I thought. Yeah, you. you not even a engineered pulp. Engineered. Cow bone kind of. You could make like a cement like grind it down. And yeah, probably something. Plus, you could of, suck the marrow out of it. Yeah, but anyway, <laughs> it's, it's funny sucking. how long it took me to come up with something that people hadn't been making houses out of. Okay, Evan, take us home with a quote. This job is a great scientific adventure, but it's also a great human adventure. Mankind has made giant steps forward. However, what we know is really very, very little compared to what we still have to know. Fabiola Gionati, Higgs boson physicist. <laughs> Great name, yeah. Fabiola yeah. Gionati. Fabiola. That's a good quote. Yeah. It's always important to remember that what we don't know is still vastly outweighed. Absolutely. Right. And, That's and, right. The, and the more you know, the more you realize, oh man, we know even, we know even less right. than we thought. The more we discover, the less we know. I think at this point in my life, I feel like because of my awareness of what I don't know, I feel like I know the least out of any point in my life. It's in a weird way. That's funny. When I was in my you know 20s, more, it felt like right. I knew everything. Yeah. Right, because the horizon has expanded. It's, it's... it's the known unknowns. Yeah. There's greater known unknowns. All right, so <laughs> that ends this episode. Thank you uh, for joining us for this live streaming episode of the SGU. As always, thank you guys for joining me. Sure, Steve, man. we thank should you, do Steve. it again. Steve. We should do it again <laughs> like in five minutes. <laughs> and until next week, this is your Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. <laughs> Skeptic's Guide to the Universe is produced by SGU Productions, dedicated to promoting science and critical thinking. For more information, visit us at theskepticsguide.org. Send your questions to info at theskepticsguide.org. And if you would like to support the show and all the work that we do, go to patreon.com slash skepticsguide and consider becoming a patron and becoming part of the SGU community. Our listeners and supporters are what make SGU possible. 